things, and he wants to connect us to his joy. And because how I many know the joy of the Lord is stronger than your good day? How I many know the joy of the Lord? How I many know something I mean, like the weather today wasn't fantastic? And how I many know we had to get through some stuff to get here, right? We had to go through the rain. We had to go through the wind. You know, good job getting to church today. I know that your flesh didn't want to be here. And, um, but, but what God has for us is stronger than what's going on in the world. And there's an instability that's in the world. There's a shaking that's in the world. But how many know God's kingdom is not shaking? And one-third of God's kingdom is this joy that I'm talking about. And I'm telling you, we can access this joy, and we can maintain this joy, and we can live in this joy. I have seen a greater level of joy in my home as I've been studying this and as I have been pursuing this. Now, I'm not saying that we're all, you know, we're all, you know, rolling around in a bed of roses and, and you know, Mary Poppins and teeth full, full of sugar and all happy and joyful all the time because we're not. You know, we have ups and we have downs. We have arguments. We're normal people. You know what I'm saying? I would never, I never want to present this facade of fake, you know, but what I am saying is, is I'm learning how to access this more and getting it more in my life. And what I have found is when that joy is flowing out of me, the world looks like a different place. There's a light and there's a strength. And not only that, how many know people are drawn to joy? As I have been accessing this joy more and more in my life, it, it, it draws people to me for the purpose of witnessing. You know, when I'm out, you know, or I might be in the gym or something like that, and I'm laughing, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm talking, and I'm joyful, people, people start to, people want what you have, and then how many know, then you can direct them to Jesus. Can I get an amen? It opens the door for ministry. And so, and this joy is available to all of us. But we've had, you know, under legalism, I didn't have any joy. I was miserable under legalism because I was always trying to earn it. I was always trying to deserve it. And, um, and I faked like I was happy, but I wasn't. <laughs> I was not. I mean, we, we fa- how are you? I am blessed. You are blessed. More blessed than you, you know. And, like, it was just this fake stuff. And um, I hate that. I'm not asking you to fake it till you make it. I'm not asking you to force a smile on your face. I'm just telling you that God, in God's kingdom, there's a joy that's your strength, and it's available to you. And it's powerful. And we just have to learn how to access it. You know, how many know that the ability to fly has been on this planet for a couple, for, for, for since the beginning of creation? But how many of people just learned how to fly a couple, maybe 100 or 200 years ago, right? But the, the law of lift has been here the whole time. And there is an access to God's joy that we have as children of God that is going to affect our lives. How many know that when you're in a state of joy, that your, life, your day is going to be better? How many know your marriage is going to be better? How many know your parenting is going to be better, right? Righteousness, peace, and joy. And these are things that, that we have access to. And so as I've been teaching this, um, I, 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 I want to, it's not just head knowledge. It's not just um, information. It's not just Bible trivia. It's an actual invitation into God's strength. And in the days ahead, how I many know we've got to find a way to have joy beyond the circumstances that are around us? We've got to find a way to do it. And the way to do it is the kingdom. Like, we can enjoy the ride or we can not enjoy the ride. I want to enjoy the ride. And a part of enjoying the ride is learning how to tap into this, to this joy and letting it flow out of our lives. Amen? And I said last week, and, and I'll say this again, the joy is such a powerful commodity and such a precious commodity it is that it was the reward that was given to Jesus for enduring the cross. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And I know I've been taught a lot of times and I even taught myself that that joy was us and I do believe that joy was us, but there was joy that Jesus had as a goal and that's how precious that joy was. And so anyway, it's here for us. We can access it, but we, we, we may have to change the way we think. We may have to change what we focus on. How many of y'all willing to change to get good results? I am. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I don't want what I've always had. I'm ready to change. I want... I want I want, I, want, I want things to be better in every aspect of my life. And, and in God's kingdom, he's not asking you to earn it or deserve it. He's just asking you to really to change the way you think and to change the way that you look at things. <clears throat> How many know God's not nervous about the state of the world? The Bible says in Scripture, he that sits in the heavens laughs. Amen? 
And so I, I believe that God is wanting to pour out a, a joy-filled strength into the body of Christ for the purpose of strengthening them and helping them, but also for it to be a, a form of drawing people to Jesus as well. Amen? How many of y'all you enjoy being around a happy person? You just do. And so uh, the first thing I want to look at, let's go to John 16, please. And I want to cover this briefly because this isn't the primary thing that I want to talk about today. But I do want to mention this because it's in the scriptures and it's in relation to joy. And uh, John 16 and verse 23, it says, In that day you shall ask me nothing. This is Jesus talking. And, this, and that day you shall ask me nothing. Truly, truly, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give to you. Heretofore you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. One of the things that, get, that causes you to have full joy is when God answers your prayers. It's the truth. They're, 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 and this is the way God's designed. God set this thing up where he's like, I'm God, I'm all powerful, I'm your dad, I love you. Ask me for something cool. And let me do it for you so that your joy will be full. Now, don't ask God for things he's already given you or you will be super frustrated. Don't ask God. As a born-again child of God, don't ask God for a new heart. You already got one. As, as, as a born-again child of God, don't ask God. I mean, don't, I mean, there's so many things that God has already given you. How many of God's made you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? How many of you have God's love? You have God's acceptance, amen? You have all of these things that God's given you, but then there are things that are not within, the, within that that you want to ask God. I mean, you know, it feels good to have answered prayer. I really wanted to have Michelle testify today, but she's not here. But Michelle, um, Michelle Robinson, two weeks ago, uh, she got completely healed in her back. And when, and when she comes, when she comes, I'd love for her to, to share the testimony. But she's had um, two vertebrae in her back that have been rubbing together for years, and uh, has just had pain. You know, just had pretty much almost constant pain. And uh, when Peter was here, and Peter prayed for her. The, all the pain left, and she has not had any pain since he prayed for her. I mean, that's awesome, right? I mean, old, and, and, you know, when she was telling me about it, she was giddy. Like, she was excited about it. Why? Because, I mean, old, when, you, when you know God hears you and God answers your prayer, it brings some joy into your heart. And what I want to encourage you is ask. A lot of times it's like we have not because we ask not. Ask God for, to do stuff for you. Can I get an amen? And, and so many times, you know, we can take this minimalist attitude, well, I'm not going to ask God, and I'm not, you know, God's, you know, God's busy. He's got stuff he's doing. Look, the way, the God is so big and so powerful, he can, he can spend your entire life looking at you like you're the only person that's ever existed. You have all of his attention, you have all of his focus, you have all of his time, okay? And so he likes it when you trust in his goodness and you ask him. Hey, get an amen. Now, and, and, and so, and there is an element of joy that comes through just simply having prayer answered. Amen. Now, um, now let's turn, flip back to Romans 14, verse 17. We're going to step into what we have today. And, uh, you know, the way we're going to do things during the teaching today is just a little bit different, um, but I, this is what I felt led to do. So Romans 14 and verse 17, you guys were just there, but I want to highlight an aspect of this because we're kind of, we're pivoting a little bit in our teaching it says, for the kingdom of God is not, is it hot in here or is it just me? Is everybody hot? Can we turn that heat down pretty please? Or turn the air on, whatever we got to do. Hot people in church ain't good. I'm just going to tell you right now. It's, you, 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 you're better off being almost cold, you know. Anyway, Romans 14 verse 17 says, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy in the Holy Spirit. So, in the passage of Scripture, there is the joy that I'm talking about is in the Holy Spirit. And so this joy that I'm talking about, it's not born of man. It's not born of your willpower. It's not born of fake it till you make it. The third person of the Trinity having relationship with the Holy Spirit, the, the joy comes from the Holy Spirit. Now, this area, of, when you start talking about the Holy Spirit, um, people, people get nervous, people get 
because um, they've had bad experiences. They've had weird things happen. Um, and, and maybe in the, in the teaching of, of talking about the Holy Spirit. But I just want to encourage you that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And without an understanding and an embracing of who he is, it's going to be difficult for us to operate in this joy that I'm talking about because this joy does come from the Holy Spirit. Okay? I've, I've described all different things that affect your joy, but now we're going we're gonna to kind of pivot. We're going to start talking about the Holy Spirit in the next couple of weeks. Me and Grant are going to tag team on some teaching, and um, we're, we're, that's what we're going to be taking a look at. Now, um, I'm going to roll through a few scriptures here quickly. Um, Acts 13 and verse 52, um, it says, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And so once again, there's a link between the Holy Spirit and joy. They were filled with joy and fill with the Holy Spirit. And so now turn to, turn to Ephesians chapter 5, and I want to take a look at this. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, and, and, and this is a powerful uh, uh, passage of Scripture, and it's an invitation for you. Um, and it's not even an invitation, it's actually a command. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, Therefore do not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, which is in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And so, you know, talking about being filled with the Spirit, that be filled with the Spirit, that's like, that's, a, that's, that's in the perfect present tense, and it is a command to being continually filled with the Spirit. And that is a choice. Like, how many know as we came in here today and we were in that place of worship, how many of y'all experienced the presence of God, Right? and you felt the presence of the Lord, that is one of the ways that you can have a fresh filling of God's Spirit is through corporate worship, coming together and worshiping together. There's something special about when we come together. But you need a fresh filling. How many know your car needs an oil change? How many know you need a fresh filling of God's Spirit? Now, you are, once you're born again, you're the righteousness of God, you're one with Christ, uh, there's nothing that's going to be added to your identity um, you know, you're, you're not going to get more of Jesus in the sense that um, you can somehow get more of Jesus on the inside of you. You're not going to make yourself more right with God. You're not going to have greater access to the promises of God. All these things are given to you when you're born again, but Scripture encourages us to be filled with the Spirit afresh and anew on, on a regular basis. This is going to help you in the joy of the Lord. How many of you know when you got a fresh feeling of God's Spirit, there's a greater sense of joy and peace in your life? It's just reality. And, um, and we're gonna and we're gonna be taking a look at how we do that in a in a practical sense. And so, um, and in the context of the scripture, it says like it encourages you, don't be, don't be drunk. How I many you know some people lean on alcohol to try to um, give give them relief from stress? You know, and, and, and you know, I'm not saying that, you know, drinking is a sin in and of itself. I don't believe that Scripture teaches that. Um, you know, Jesus turned the water into wine. Um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with people who can do it responsibly. Some people can do it responsibly. Some people can't. And, um, and how I many you know, you can, you, you can do anything irresponsibly. How I many of you can eat irresponsibly? I do, I do it somewhat regularly, praise God. Uh, how I many you know, you can sleep irresponsibly, right? How I many you know, you can use sex irresponsibly? You know, how I many you know that you can, th there's a lot of different things that, that God has given us that if we'll do it properly, then it's okay. Uh, but it's, it's the improper use of it that is not okay. And so what he's saying here is he's, he's talking about being filled with the spirit of fresh and new. How I many you know there are people that lean on drugs to try to, to, to alleviate their pain, right? There are people that, that, that lean on maybe prescription medication. And if you if you have medicine and stuff like that, I'm not pointing a finger at you in any way, shape, or fa form or fashion. But what I'm saying is, like, God's Spirit is better than any of the things that I just described. And there's a feeling of God's Spirit that will satisfy you in a way that, that, that wine can't, in a way that all of these things can't. Like, in their time, they only had a couple ways to be intoxicated. In our time, we have, like, a million ways to be intoxicated, right? And I think one of the reasons that people search for intoxication is they want an escape. They want, they, they feel pressure, or they're experiencing sorrow, and they're looking how to be happy. 
you know, back in the day when I was hooked on drugs and stuff like that, um, you know, I, I, that's one of the, the reasons that I use drugs is I didn't really know how to be happy any other way. I had taught myself that I needed substance in order to be happy. And so I had a time period in my life where before I did anything, I had to get high. Before I went to watch a movie, I had to get high. Before I, you know, went to the park, I had to get high because I could not see myself being happy apart from this substance, right? And so a lot of us are trying to find joy and pleasure in places that aren't really bringing life to us. And God's saying that my spirit is better than wine. My spirit is better than anything else out there that can satisfy you. And so it, they're putting it in the context of someone looking for some form of, of escape or alleviation from the pressures of the day. It says, don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And so how many know that we, when we come to church, how many know we get a fresh filling of God's Spirit? That's one of the cool things about coming to church is there's that corporate sense of worship and you're going to get a fresh feeling of God's Spirit. There's a strength to that, and it's a blessing. But how many know you can learn how to be filled with God's Spirit on your own? If you can learn how to do that, it'll change your life. I'm telling you right now, it will totally change your life. And um, one of the ways that that happens, and we'll read the rest of the Scripture, it says, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's something about praise and worship that's going to give you a fresh feeling of God's presence. And it doesn't say people that sing good, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. That's one of the, that's one of the things I think we've got completely wrong in the body of Christ. No, we're all called to sing to the Lord. Not everybody's called to sing in the mic <laughs> to the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. But we're all called to sing to the Lord. And, and this, this, little, this little passage of Scripture, there's just like a little secret in here. And, and I, a person I know that does this all the time is Paul, Paul Bradberg. How many you know, you, you, while you're working, you can, you can have a little song in your heart. Through your day, you can have a little song. You can have a little thanksgiving. And it might be something that, that's, you know, on, on the radio station or one of the songs we sing. It might be a little something God just drops in your heart. Just a little phrase that you sing. How I many you know when you chew gum, you can draw flavor from the gum over a period of time, right? You can take just a song, a little thanksgiving, and you can be pulling the strength of God's Spirit into your life no matter what you're doing or where you're at. If you can learn how to do that, it'll change your life. But it's like, I, don't, I get to this passage and I'm so excited about what it offers, but I don't know how to teach anybody how to do this. It's kind of the same thing as teaching on meditation. Like you can't sit down and really make somebody learn how to do this. It's more of just an invitation. It's like God saying, if you'll sing unto me through your day, I'll keep you full of the Spirit. And I'm not saying you don't got to belt out like some kind of opera star or something like that, but you can sing to the Lord. I mean, I know one of the things I like to do when I'm cleaning up the kitchen, like, I'm, you know, Stacy loves to cook, and none of us like to clean. And so I clean <laughs> because she's a better cook than I am, right? And so... Uh, a lot of times when I'm cleaning the kitchen, I will, I will just I will have a song in my heart. And not all the time. Sometimes I'm in there just, you know, cleaning and not enjoying it whatsoever. But there have been times, I mean, just being honest, but then there are times when I'm like praising the Lord and I've got this song in my heart and I'm singing to the Lord. And you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a worship leader, but I mean, you know, my dad likes the way I sing. Come on, Father God. Can't get an amen. Father God likes the way you sing. He, because it says sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. It's not your tone. It's not, it's not you hitting the perfect note. It's your heart. When you're singing with grace in your heart towards the Lord, you're in a place of gratitude. You're in a place of worship. And I've had times when I have cleaned the kitchen and I have been so filled with joy afterwards that I was so strong because I received a fresh dose, a fresh infilling of God's presence, and I walked out thankful. Y'all tracking me here. I've had times when I, I worshiped so hard I cried in the kitchen. You know, and, and while, I'm, while, I'm, while I'm like worshiping God, and stuff. now I've had many times when it was none of those things. And I was like, dear God, I wish she'd clean up after herself while she cooks. Man, she just, 
you know. You know, and so I've had moments like that, you know what I'm saying? But when I do find this place, I come out stronger. Y'all tracking me here? And there's a way where we can access this frequency of heaven and be filled with the spirit of fresh and anew, and it really comes down to, like, singing unto the Lord. You know, and, or it could be, and it doesn't necessarily, it could just be you taking a scripture. Anybody taking one scripture and just meditated it through the day? Gosh, if you've ever done that. I remember one time I took two words while I was working in the secular world, and I meditated those all day long. I was so strong by the time I got there. You know what the two words were? In Christ. That's it. I just thought about in Christ all day long. And man, by the time I got done with my shift, I was about to explode. But how many of you know, it can be difficult to focus on something like that when you're surrounded by the world. But if you can learn how to tap into this, and I can't really teach you how to do this. All I can do is just say, hey, man, this is available to you if you want to try this. You know, Monday, man, get a song in your heart or get into a psalm or something like that. One of the things I've been doing before I preach on the radio here lately, and this is what I felt led to do, I'll get everything lined out that I'm going to do when I'm going to preach, but then an hour before I go on the radio, I pull into this Super America that's right next to the radio station. Radio station is just right down the road. And I pull into the Super America. I got this same parking place I pull into. I turn my radio off. And you know what I do? I praise God for about an hour. No music, no nothing. Just me in there clapping, making my joyful noise, freaking everybody out around me. But my thought, and you know, because people, listen, if they can play their vulgar music loud with their windows rolled down, talking about sex, drugs, and violence. Do you think it's okay if we praise God? You know what I'm saying? Now, I don't roll my windows down and freak everybody out. I have tinted windows, and I roll them up. But every once in a while, I have a moment where somebody will be like, what is that dude doing over there? And I'll be like, what's up? <laughs> but, but what I'm doing is I am doing this, and I'm getting filled with God's Spirit so that when I'm on the radio... I'm not just speaking in my own strength, but I'm speaking out of a place of joy and peace and love. Y'all tracking me here? And this is available to any of us, and God will teach you how to do it. But, that, that, but be filled with the Spirit. Man, we need that in our lives. We need a fresh feeling of God's Spirit. And if we can learn how to do it on the regular, how many of you know God's Spirit's always ready? Always ready, always available. And, and so anyway, and so... Psalm 16 and verse 11, it says, Show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. And then Psalm 22 and verse 3, God, you inhabit the praises of your people. How many know you can shift the atmosphere through your praise and worship? That's one of the things I've noticed down at the shelter. Like, you know, we've had times, you know, when, when we're ministering outside and, I mean, we're right in the midst of just the, 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 it's the drug area of Georgetown. So you got people walking by, you know, in prostitution. You got people walking by, you know, hooked on meth. And there's a meth house right down the road. I mean, it's, it's a crazy environment, right? And there's usually a battle when we, when we come, right? But, but once, once we start to worship and then we stay there, we got to get through and get, but the whole atmosphere changes out there. And all of a sudden, here's, here, now how many of God's been there the whole time? I'm not saying that, that praise and worship brings God, but I'm saying like it, it will open a door for the manifestation of his presence. And then once his presence comes, it don't matter what's going on. Everything has just settled in, and there's this beautiful little flow, right? And so you can do that in your daily life. You can do that in your home. And you can get that fresh and feeling of, 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 of God's presence. One of the ways we can do it, it's going to help you with your joy. I've had times after I have my praise and worship service in Super America uh, parking lot where I go into that radio station and I am so full of joy because I've, 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 re I've received that fresh and feeling of God's presence. Amen? Y'all tracking me here? And so it's like an invitation. It's like you can, you can, this is a part of connecting to the joy that I'm talking about. It's in God's presence. So, um, Jude one twenty, and I'm not going to teach on this long, but I'm going to mention this. Jude chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, 
Praying in the Spirit will build you up and keep you full of the Spirit in a way that few other things can. Okay? It's extremely powerful. It's extremely misunderstood. But praying in the Spirit is one of the most powerful things you can do. I pray in the Spirit all the time. That's my family. I do. I mean, I mean, Ethan, Stacy. Like, I pray in the Holy Ghost. I'm like, I gotta go pray. I gotta go pray. I pray in the Spirit all the time. Like, when people go on ministry trips with me, it's like, he prays in the Spirit all the time. And, but I don't teach on it that much. I don't teach. I don't know. I just, I don't. I'm always focused on the gospel. But, like, I love this gift. I need this gift because this, this gives me God's strength. And I can't do it on my own. I can't do anything on my own. And so when, I, when I'm praying, when I take some time and I pray in the Spirit, I'm connecting and building myself up spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally. It's that word oikodomio. And it literally means like you're, you're building your house. You're building yourself up. And you're not just building yourself up in the Spirit. You're build, they, they, man, they've done studies that when people pray in the Spirit, it activates a different portion of the brain than it, that is activated when somebody's speaking. Secular people have done these studies. Sec, did you have something? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Come on. And you look different. Like your skin is better, your countenance is better. That's awesome. Amen. And it's a gift that we all have. We can all access this gift. And... Um, it, you know, and they've done studies. It activates a different part of the body. You know what else it does? It increases your immune system. It's amazing. I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on about the benefits of this. And so, but I could take an entire message and just teach on this, okay? So I'm not going to. I'm just going to give you an overview, all right? But next Sunday, Grant is going to teach just on praying in the Spirit. And I just want to encourage you Listen to this teaching. Now, if you've not been, if you don't, if you're not praying in the spirit and you want to, I would encourage you to listen to bring that into your life um, and to receive the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But also, if, if it's something that you used to do but you don't do anymore, this is going to help you get stirred up in this area because it's literally something you can do any place at any time, and it's extremely powerful. I know it's been something that's been misunderstood. I know the enemy attacks this hardcore. He does not want people getting a hold of this. Um, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time teaching on it. I'm just going to say, but this is one of the primary ways that you keep yourself filled up with the Spirit is by praying in the Holy Ghost. Grant is going to teach on that next Sunday, and he's going to do a way better job than what I could do. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. He's going to go. He's an excellent teacher, and what I've asked him to do is just go through the Scriptures and prove it. <laughs> And he's really, really good at that. He'll just go, Scripture, 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 Scripture. And if you don't have the gift, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have faith for you to receive the gift. And if you've let that gift lie dormant, it's going gonna, it's gonna to put you in remembrance to stir that gift back up and start using that again. Because a lot of, so many things get fixed when we pray in the Spirit. Because I'll just say this, when you're praying in the Spirit, you're praying out God's perfect will for your life. We don't always know how to pray. We don't know how to fix things. But what, when you're praying in the Spirit, you're giving God your vocal cords. You're giving God his, the God-given authority that He's given to you, and He's using your mouth to get done what He wants to do in the earth. And while He's doing that, He's also building you up spiritually and physically, and you're being filled with the Spirit of fresh and anew. It's, it's one of the most powerful things in Scripture. So, but Grant's going to teach on that next Sunday. I really encourage you to check that out. Now, Let's go to Matthew chapter 3, and, um, I, I just, and I only have 20 minutes left, but I just want to give you an overview of God's Spirit. And, um, and we're, so we're going to go through these quickly to kind of set the stage for where we're going in the future. Um, Matthew uh, chapter 3 and verse 11, uh, John the Baptist talking about Jesus, he said, Indeed, I baptize you with water under repentance, that he who comes after me is mightier than I, 
whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And so John, not only did he say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John says that one of the primary reasons he's coming is I can baptize you in water, but this guy's going to baptize you in the Spirit with the Holy Ghost and fire. And, and so what I wanna, I'm going to just start going through the Scriptures as we close here to start building a case for the importance of the Spirit of God in your personal life, but also in the God's kingdom, we can't do anything without God's Spirit. And I'm going to tell you right now, we can't reach this generation without the Holy Ghost. They're too wrapped up. It is going to take a supernatural power of God to reach this generation. That is where I'm setting my expectancy. Church ain't going to get, you know, just like Cheryl was sharing earlier when she was giving that word, it's going to take a total sh- a paradigm bust, shift. But the one thing that will reach everyone is the power of God. Because, boy, when, when, when the power of God shows up, I mean, game over. And that's what, that's what we want. We want that for, for, for everybody, but specifically this generation. That's in, you can't argue these people into truth. Their minds are too wrapped in, in, in deception. You can't argue them into it. You can't debate them into it. But, boy, you had an experience with the power of God, and all your arguments just fall right down to the ground. Anybody ever had an experience with the power of God before? It changed you forever in a way that no, nothing else can. So anyway, so uh, John chapter 3 and verse 5, we'll go through these quickly. I'm going to try not to preach too much. I'm just going to hit these. Jesus answered and said, he's talking to Nicodemus. He said, truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So you, the, uh, you can't even enter into the kingdom without being born again of God's Spirit. The kingdom is a spirit kingdom. I mean, you know, the kingdom of God is within you. Like you don't get like uh, you don't get like a a mark on your body that says that you're born again. How I many you know what happens is you you get a new spirit. You get born again. That spirit is within you. And so Jesus has been announcing his kingdom is coming. His kingdom is coming. John the Baptist is saying this guy could baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. And he's saying that um, you can't even enter into the kingdom without the Spirit of God. Now, turn to Acts chapter 1, please. Like I said, I'm going to go through these quickly, but, but I'm going to show you the church wasn't even born until the Spirit of God came. You know, we, we had Jesus who accomplished the goal, and, you know, the, one, of the, one of the purposes of the cross and, and the finished work of the cross for Jesus is to make you clean so that the Spirit of God can move inside of you. How many know God cleansed you so you could be His temple? It's the truth. I mean, it's like the whole point, one of the, and, and Jesus speaking to his disciples, he would say to them, it's expedient for you that I go. And when Jesus told them he was going to go, how many of oh, they got really sad? They got really worried. They're like, what? You mean you're going to turn the world upside down and you're going to leave us? He's like, no, no, no. It's really important to you that I leave because if I leave, I'm going to send another. I'm going to send a comforter. How many of oh, it's more powerful to have God live in you than God walk next to you? I mean, so many times we would have liked to have been alive during the earthly walk of Jesus and hung out with Jesus, but Jesus is like, I got something better. I'm going to move inside of you. And so um, Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, and, and so we had Jesus died on the cross. He was raised again from the dead. And then we got 40 days where the disciples are in the upper room. There's 120 of them, and they're waiting for the promise to come. They're waiting on the outpouring of the Spirit Because he's like, you can't get anything done that you need to get done until I fill you with my spirit. You can't get done anything that you need to get done until you become the temple of my presence. So Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. This has been a promise that's been handed down for for thousands of years that God was going to do this. He says, wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. How many of them had to wait for Pentecost? They had to wait for that, for that festival. They had to wait for that time period. It says, when they therefore were come together, they asked him of him, saying, Lord, when will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, 
while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So the last thing he says to them before he floats into the sky is, I'm sending my spirit. Don't leave until I send my spirit. Wait. Don't try to preach. Don't try to minister. Do nothing. Just wait. Then Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so here comes... Here comes the New Testament church. Here comes the kingdom of God. Here comes the power of God. And so, and then immediately, it actually turned the world upside down. And what I love is they didn't just stay in the upper room. They got filled with the presence of God. They got filled with the power of God. And they busted out into the streets. Why? It couldn't be contained. It couldn't be controlled. It couldn't be relegated to a church service. It couldn't be relegated to just a meeting. It immediately had impact on the world that they lived in. And immediately they, they, they were in the marketplace. They were around all these different people. And everybody was astonished at what was going on. How many of the Spirit of God came and everyday life was disrupted? And the world was turned upside down by the power of God. Verse 12, I'm just going to kind of skip through these. Acts chapter 2 and verse 12, it says, And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying to one another, What meaneth this? So they were just, and I'm not going to go into all the details that was happening, but they were speaking in tongues, and they were uh, speaking out in other people's languages. Other people were understanding them. They were in the marketplace. All these just supernatural things were happening, and the early church is being birthed, and there's about to be, 3,000 people saved after one sermon from a man that denied the Lord three times because that's how God rolls. I love it. And so, uh, and this is Peter's sermon. I'm going to read you just a little excerpt of it. Acts chapter 2 and verse 32. This Jesus has God raised up whereof we are all witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost He has shed forth this, which you now see and hear, see and hear, see and hear. I mean, the invisible kingdom became visible because the power of God was seen upon the people. This is what I'm anticipating. This is what I want to happen. I mean, the the longer I live and the more I just fulfill the call of God on my life, like we need, we, we need, we need some help. There's a war going on and it looks like we're losing, but we're not. God always waits and always makes it... How many know God always comes through? But he's, He always comes through when we have no other hope but Him. You know what I'm saying? I mean, how many know everything we've tried to put our hope on, we've not been able to put it on in the world that we're living in right now? Oh, this political guy is going to do something. Oh, this is going to happen. Oh, this. Oh, uh, uh. <laughs> We need God. <laughs> it's okay. It's, he likes it like that. And, and so all the stuff that the enemy's been doing is going to be unraveled in a very short period of time by the power of God. Amen? So, and then we, we drop down to verse 36. Uh, Peter's still talking here. He says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the, that same Jesus whom you crucify, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so there was a salvation that happened. Uh, that word repentance means changing your mind, changing the thing. How I many old they, they were a people that thought they could save themselves? They were a people that thought their works were going to be good enough. And how I many old Jesus was that stumbling stone that came and told them, Y'all can't do it, but if you trust in me, I'll do it for you, right? But then the next thing that they were going to receive was the Holy Spirit. Now, turn to John 16. we got 10 minutes left until we're done. And uh, like I said, I'm just giving you a little bit of an overview uh, about uh, the Spirit of God here for just a little bit. And, but it's going to take the Spirit of God to get the job done. We just can't do it any other way. Church, as usual, is not going to win the world and not going to crack open darkness like we need it to. 
John 16, and in verse 5, I quoted this a little bit earlier, but then this is Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. He says, But now I go, I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you ask me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And so now we're going we're gonna to take a look at what it is that the Spirit of God does. Because a lot of us were taught incorrectly concerning what the Spirit of God does. And all this is in preparation for what's going to happen next Sunday. A lot of us were taught that the Spirit of God is the person that always points out our sin and points out what we're doing wrong and just kind of like nags us. That is an incorrect teaching. That is not what the Spirit of God actually does. Anyone in here enjoy being nagged? Nobody. Nobody. Being nagged is one of the worst things in the world because it, if you're nagged, you lose all desire to do what you're being nagged to do. All, all men, just look straight forward right now. Stay calm. We're going to get through this. Don't look at your wife. No elbows. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. How I many you know men can nag too? They can. Anybody can nag. I'm sorry. Uh, but being the Holy Spirit is not your nagger. He's not, well, you need to, you need to, you need to, you got to, you got to, you got to, you got to. You know, we were taught that the Holy Spirit was just ultra sensitive and he was always pointing out our sin. He was always pointing out what we were doing wrong. That's incorrect teaching. It's not biblical at all. Jesus right here, he tells us exactly what the Spirit of God has come to do. And so let's take a look at it. It says, when he has come, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Reprove the world of sin, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. This is the only sin that the Spirit of God convicts people for. Unbelief in Jesus. That's why people who are not saved sometimes don't like you. I'm not kidding, man. I have people that... They just, I mean, it's ridiculous. But the reason they don't like me is because when I'm around, the presence of God is around, and the Holy Spirit is convicting them to get saved. And so as a result of that, like, you're around them. And like, I have people in the gym that, that, that just absolutely just, they just don't like me. And there's no reason for them not to like me other than what I'm telling you. And anybody ever experienced that before? You're saved, they're not saved. You are a stench of death to those people. You're the aroma of life to the believer. Or you ever get around somebody and you know they're saved. Like we, we've been on vacation before, and I, I've told Ethan, I'll be like, that person right there, they got Jesus. And then over a period of time, we'll come to find out, and they got, well, I could look at them and tell. You know what I'm saying? Like there are some people, like they're manifesting the Lord. Like you could tell. Like I saw somebody the other day, I thought, man, that person's saved. And then I, over, I was walking through the grocery aisle, and I saw this lady's countenance, and I thought, she's got the Lord. And then I heard them as I walked by, and they were talking about Jesus. Because, so, we can recognize Jesus in others. But how many know that people that aren't saved, they don't like it? And, and, they, and, 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 and the enemy is trying to keep them from getting saved. And so, as a result of that, a lot of, and then also, how many know your presence can convict them of the sin of not believing in Jesus. Amen. Now, how many of you know that's actually love? If you see somebody drowning, it's love. It's not love to say, you're not drowning, you're doing great. <laughs> like, that's not love. And, that, and that's one of the things that the enemies tried to hijack in his attempt to define love in a new age way is everything's okay and everything's all right. If I tell a drowning man that he's just fine, I don't love him. I don't care about him at all. I actually hate him. You're exactly right. So truth rocks the boat. Truth shakes things up. And, there is, and truth says there's a right and there's a wrong. And so the Spirit of God comes to convict the world of the sin of not believing in Jesus. How many of you know that's the only thing that keeps you out of heaven? Not believing in Jesus. That's it. It's not like, you know... I come up and I got my Rolodeck card of how many sins I committed, and Leah's got her Rolodeck card of how many sins she committed. As long as we didn't commit, you know, 687,053, how many of us not like that? How many of you, there's no amount of sin that's greater than the blood of Jesus? The only thing that prevents you from receiving salvation 
is refusing it. That's it. In my opinion, that's what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. Re- refusing to be saved. And not allowing that conviction to work in your heart. Amen? So, reprove the world of sin. Of sin because they do not believe on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And so now, the Spirit of God is to convict you of the fact that you're right with God. See, how many know when Jesus was in the world, his, in his earthly body, his disciples could draw confidence from the fact that he was there. Here comes a group of Roman soldiers walking by. Here comes a group of Levitical priests walking by. Ain't neither one of them like them. But they can look over and say, we got Jesus, we're good. God's with us. But how many know when Jesus left, they now need something else to convict them or convince them that they're right with God? That's the Holy Ghost. That is what the Spirit of God is called to use. The Spirit of God is not called to convict the believer of sin. The Spirit of God is there to convince the believer that they're right with God. That's how you actually get free from sin. Because when when sin is knocking on your door, the Spirit of God will convict you of the fact that that's not who you are. That's not you. I know that you might be tempted to do that, but that's not you. How many know your conscience convicts you of right and wrong? Your conscience will let you know. But the Spirit of God, He's got a higher order than these things. He's going to convict the world of unbelief, and He's going to convince you that you're right with God. And out of Him convincing you that you're right with God, He's going to convince you of who you are. You know, when the prodigal son came home, the father didn't tell him what he was doing with sin. When the prodigal son came home, the father reminded him who he was. So I know you're covered in pig slop, but here, let me put this robe of righteousness on your shoulders. Let me put this ring on your hand. Let me put these shoes on your feet. Let me give you provision. Let me love you because I know you've been living in a way that's not who you are, but let me remind you who you are. That's what the Holy Ghost does. That's how it works, folks. The Spirit of God is going to convict you, convince you of your righteousness and your identity. That's what actually sets you free from sin. And nowhere in here does it say the Holy Spirit's your nagger. We were taught he was our nagger. And you know what? Ain't nobody want to be around a nagger. You don't want to spend time with a nagger. And so the enemy is the one who's worked overtime to get that thought process in the church. No, you know who the Holy Spirit is? Listen to me. He's your comforter. He will comfort you. He will not leave you comfortless. So even so when you make a mistake and you fall into something you shouldn't be falling into, the Spirit of God is going to comfort you that that's not who you are. I know, that, I know you think that's who you are, but that's actually not who you are. Can I get an amen to that? Golly, if the body of Christ could get a hold of just that truth right there. So when someone's falling into sin, you don't need to throw them under the bus. You don't need to, now, you know, if they're they're saying that what they're doing is not wrong, that's different. That's a totally different ballgame. They have to recognize that what they're doing is wrong. But how many know what you need to do is to preach the gospel to that person so they can awake to righteousness and remember who they are and wake up and be like, no, wait a minute, what what was all that about? That's not who I am. This is who I am. The Spirit of God is going to convict you of righteousness. And he says, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. How many of the prince of this world has been judged? What has he been judged? He's been judged as, he's been condemned, right? And so, how many know you are not to be condemned? The devil is to be condemned. The devil is to be judged. Y'all tracking me here? Those are the three things the Holy Spirit does. He convicts the world of the sin of unbelief. He convicts the believer of righteousness. And then he, then he, he convicts us of the judgment of the prince of this world. And that there's a separation between us and them. When temptation comes knocking on your door, it's not God against you. It's God with you against the enemy that's tempting you. You have to know that, man. There's no point in your life is God ever not on your team or on your side. He is with you and he's for you. Now, drop down to verse 19 and we'll close right here. John 16 and verse 19, and Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit because he he ends talking about joy. He says, Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said to him, Do you inquire among yourselves of that that I said, A little while and you shall not see me again, and in a little while you shall see me? Truly, truly, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. He's talking about the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. A woman, when she's in travail, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish 
for joy that a man is born into this world. And you now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice. Hey, I'm going to see you again. How's he going to see you? He's going to see you by his presence living on the inside of you. Your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man takes away from you. This is talking about the joy of God's Spirit. Amen? And so if we want to access and live in this place of joy, we're going to have to learn how to be filled with the Spirit regularly. And that happens in the church setting, in the corp- corporate atmosphere of worship. But how many know we can also, once again, learn how to do that on our own? And then the next thing we're going to take a look at is talking about praying in the Spirit. We're going to be looking at that next Sunday um, with Grant teaching that. And um, amen. But please understand, the Holy Spirit is not your antagonizer. The Holy Spirit is not your nagger. The Holy Spirit is, the, is your comforter, and He's going to convict you of righteousness. And out of that place, if you know that you're right with God, I mean, there, out of that place is peace, and out of that place is joy. Amen? All right, cool. Amen. Praise God. If you need to get on this giving envelope this morning, lift your hands up. We'll get one to you. Praise God. Those of you that are online, if you're giving, go to gracepointgeorgetown.com, and you guys can, can give that way. I actually have several announcements to make here this morning. Oh, we need someone to take up the offering. Yeah. Dan, will you take up the offering, sir? I'm sorry. Amen. If you need to give an envelope, Dan will get one to you. Um, just a couple announcements here. Uh, we have continued to help single moms, and we are continuing to help single moms. And so we're excited about that, and we really feel called to do that in this season that we're in. If you know of a single mom that needs help, uh, please, please contact us and please let us know. We just want to help. And we want to be a blessing. That's something that God's really laid on our heart as a church, and we want to continue to do that. Um, we, I'm sorry? Go ahead. Yes. Talk about that for a little bit. Small family right now. We can add more as many families as we want to. My sister actually is ahead of over that at the school, some of the schools in Woodford County. So the, we adopted a family of three. They have three girls. I put all of their. Um, they when they do it at the school, the kids get to pick three things for their Christmas list, and then they add in the the clothing stuff. So like each one of them shows you back there. I'm going to make on the Facebook pay, post. Um, in the messenger area, I'm going to put all this in there. And if you are going to buy something or you did buy something, put it in there. So that way we know and we can make sure that all of their wants are met and then any kind of needs, meaning clothes. I looked back, when I looked at the paper this morning, my sister sent me um, the shoe size. There must be a typo on that because all three shoe sizes say 13. And there's a five year old, a six year old, and an eight year old. So th- that can't be right. I'll find out what's up with that. But, um, that's what they want for Christmas. When we get that met, or if we get that met, um, I'll tell her we want some more kids, and she can send me as many as we, as we want or need. If you, as a family, in and of itself, want to adopt a family, let me know, and I can get a family for you, or you can do, you know, if you want to do it yourself. We did that, a few people did that last year. And if you don't want to shop and you just want to give me money, I will take all the money that we get right before the deadline and go and get the stuff that's not on the list or go get stuff to add to the list. So that's kind of what we're going to do there in regards to the family. And then we'll bring all the gifts and put them under this tree that we're going to put up today after service. So, yeah, and we're, and we're really we're looking to get single-parent families is what we really want to do. We really want to.